Welcome to the Weekly Juice Podcast, where we discuss all things real estate, personal finance, investing, entrepreneurship, and the many ways to achieve financial independence. We interview accomplished investors and entrepreneurs with the goal that their stories inspire you to take control of your financial future. Here to get your creative juices flowing while also documenting their own personal investing journeys are your hosts, Corey Jacobson and Ryan Bevilacqua. Welcome back to the Wealth Juice Podcast. As always, it's your boys, Ryan and Corey here with another episode for you. Today, we interviewed Ramon Casas. He is a real estate investor who invests heavily in seller financing. That was the the name of the game in the episode today. We really dove in on creative financing, but specifically seller financing. And then the episode kind of took a turn for honestly, the better. It was really fun. We talked about productivity and how to kind of balance your time and cut through a lot of the noise that you're seeing on social media. Yeah. Eliminate distractions. He's also, he also got his start in real estate in, um, as a agent. So he's like, he owns a brokerage. So he built it up his active income that way. And then he started driving his active income into real estate deals. He has 17 units and seller financing is like the thing that he's doing now. He explained an incredible deal not incredible, like the best deal ever, but like he, inc- he explained it incredibly. So listen for the, the seller finance deal that he talked about and the reason why it worked. I thought that was great, but really this episode is all about the product productivity hacks, how to eliminate noise and distractions. I thought that he has like a really succinct way of like, you know, how to, it's so hard in 2024 to like, and this is what we were talking about in the episode. We got real candid about like just focusing on one thing and Ramon has a way of how he's done that. He's 30 years old. He's built a great business for himself. And I think he's extremely relatable because he's doing everything that we're all trying to do, just trying to make it. And, uh, he, you know, I love his answer to what is your why. So stay for that at the end. But he was, um, he was great. He was great. We vibed really well. It was a great episode. Yeah. One quick thing I just wanted to piggyback on is I know I mentioned this earlier um, briefly on the intro, but the way he talks about blocking the noise, it's extremely relatable to, everything that society is going through right now from social media, TikTok, and this, and this almost like doom scrolling culture. And I think it's, it's a good perspective to hear how business owners and entrepreneurs are going through the same thing. It's not only like people working their nine to five jobs and just, uh, you know, an everyday individual that's scrolling and, and going through these processes, they, they kind of pivot and kind of bring you down this, this dark web of multiple decisions that you have to make and trying different things within your business to begin. And I kept calling them loops that you get in, but you like, Hey, should I try this strategy for generating new leads? Should I try this? Should I try this? There's so many different things to try. A lot of times it's just focusing in, focusing in and narrowing and mastering those five things that you need to do. And even though that there can be five other things that branch off of those five things, what can you focus, focus on the pillars and the foundation. And that's going to really help alleviate all the all the time you spent kind of wasting time and you can focus on your business versus, or yeah, on the business versus in the business of, I think he called it management culture. So I'm giving away a lot of the way the episode there, but we haven't had a talk on something that's very pertinent in today's society and that's distraction. So I think Ramon, you know, said it very well. So let's bring him in. Let's do it. It's time to flip the script on how you invest in real estate. Backflip is one company out there that is actually changing the game. Backflip is an all-in-one platform that gives you the insights, capital, and community to find and fund your fix and flip real estate deals. The app is completely free. And actually, the part Ryan and I love the most is you can pull comps, estimate profits for multiple exit strategies in seconds, and apply for a personalized loan all in one place. We're talking a 96% loan-to-cost ratio and no upfront fees. Check it out for yourself. Download the Backflip app today. Having purchased investment properties as well as primary residences, we know how daunting it can be to find a reliable lender to secure financing for real estate in the market today. With the up and down of the market, high interest rates, and the complexity of the process, honestly, it can feel like a lot. So to help out our community, we decided to bring on probably the most important person or one of the most important members of our personal real estate investing team onto the show to help out our listeners. Our mortgage lender, Travis David of CMG Home Loans, has agreed to educate our community and assist anyone looking for real estate financing. Whether you're a real estate investor looking to fund your next project or simply looking to purchase the primary residence, Travis will be able to help you and point you in the right direction. So he provides each of his clients with a tailored roadmap designed to guide them through purchasing their first investment property and strategically scale their portfolios over time. So if you're looking to either purchase your first residence, 
or maybe second residence, but a primary residence or invest in real estate, Travis is your guy. Visit our website at www.juice-enterprises.com forward slash need dash funding to book a call with Travis to explore all the loan packages that him and his team currently have available. He'll also help assess your current situation and we'll work with you to map out a plan for the future. So just remember this, we can all win. Uh, this is an example we really wanted to help out our community and something we find people are lacking in a daunting process. So if you are looking for real estate financing, we have your back. Make sure to visit our website and Travis will take care of you. Quick public service announcement for all of our listeners. First off, we want to thank you all for tuning into the show, not only this week, but we've seen you coming back episode after episode. And one thing we'd really like your assistance on, if possible, you know that our content's free and it takes a lot to pump this out every week. We're really looking to enhance our overall reviews on the show. That can be on Spotify, but mainly we are looking for Apple Podcasts. If you could please leave us a five-star review, that will go so long and so far for us. Um, really, when people are looking to get on shows, they look to see how many five-star rev reviews that show has and the number of reviews. So if you haven't left one, please just click on our show. You can scroll down to reviews and then leave the five-star. Even if you can write a little blurb about us, like what maybe has helped motivate you or anything that is relatable to your life, that would go such a long way for us. And then in turn, it allows us to get high quality guests for future episodes. So if there's been a motivating episode that you can really think back to and that has really helped you in your life, please leave a review because we'll be able to get someone like that on the show in the future to help someone else out. So that would be very much appreciated. And we look forward to continuing more episodes for you. Ramon, officially welcome to the Wealth Juice Podcast. Corey and I are so excited to have you on the show, man. Um, you've come highly regarded from one of our good friends, so we know we're in a, a good circle here, but excited to share your story with our listeners, get to know you a bit, and uh, we really appreciate you being here. So thanks for coming. Sure. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, Jesse's an all right guy. I guess we'll all agree that he's he makes some halfway decent recommendations. Hopefully I can deliver. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. We'll see what you, what you can put together for us. But uh Take us back to maybe pre-real estate, if there is a pre-real estate. I think a lot of people when they're listening to these podcasts are wondering why people chose real estate, how they got into it, and kind of that inception story. So if you could take us back and walk us through today, kind of where you're at, um, we'll kind of pick your story apart and talk about some golden nuggets along the way. The pre-real estate. Pre-real estate. Pre-real estate was, I started um, my journey in real estate when I was in college and I I didn't really know what the word meant. Like I'd heard people make a lot of money in real estate. There's a lot of wealthy guys in real estate. It's kind of this blue ocean, right? I didn't really know what that even meant. I was like, yeah, I want to get into, I think, commercial real estate, I think. And so I was in college. I actually ended up getting a, an internship with a real estate investment trust, uh, a publicly traded REIT called Camden Property Trust. They own, or, uh, own and operate and develop uh, apartment complexes around the country, their market caps, like, I don't know, 17 billion, 18 billion, like 60 or 70,000 units across the country. So that was my first entry into like real estate. And I did the traditional, uh, get an internship, then go finish your last year of college and then get offered an actual position in their real estate investment division. So I got up and moved to Tampa, Florida. Um, I'm from Albuquerque originally. And that was my first taste of, of real estate. And to be honest, it was nine, it was like a nine to five deal that just wasn't for me. It just bottom line. I just knew it at that moment. There is a couple stories I can go into about where I just knew this is not it for me. Um, and so I say that's pre real estate, even though you're like, well, that kind of sounds like real estate. It's not even close to what I do now in real estate. That was more of like a corporate environment. And so, you know, I moved back to Albuquerque and I just didn't really know what to do. And my dad actually said, hey, I think you should get your real estate license. And in my head, I'm thinking, why, why would I do that? He's a custom home builder. So I kind of grew up not really loving agents, I guess, if that makes sense. Like the builder always kind of has a gripe with the agent type of thing. And so he was like, hey, well, I just paid this agent $25,000. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Say that one more time. Yeah, I just paid him a commission of twenty five thousand, and at the time I probably had two hundred and fifty dollars grand total. Like everything I had added up was about two hundred fifty bucks. So I'm like, okay, that's a lot of dough. How? Why did you pay an agent twenty five grand? And he explained that he had a client that wanted to build a house. They brought the client to him. It was a million dollar build, and they paid him two point five percent. 
of the total build cost off the first construction draw. And I was like, interesting. How hard is it to do that? Like what's, except in my head, I'm going, well, if I do that 10 times in a year, okay, now we're talking like now we're, this is a little bit of cash. And that's what honestly truth, that's the truth of how I got drawn into real estate was I, I heard how much money you can make and I want to know more about it. Um, and so having $250, I never, uh, I couldn't afford a real estate license. So this is the best part of pre real estate. I was actually, uh, I joined a, a traveling explosive demolition team that would travel all around the Southwest and, uh, blow up my, uh, mine quarries. So not underground mines on top, on top mines. Right. Um, and we would plant a shitload of explosives and we would build these huge explosions. Um, and we do that all across the Southwest. I did that for about four months because I was like, how do you get through, how do you get four grand or five grand to get your real estate license? I'm either going to, in a short amount of time, I was like, okay, rob a bank or start selling drugs. All right. I can't do either of those. So like, what the heck am I going to make this money? That job paid very well for the hazard, uh, hazard pay over time. It was just, it just paid well. So I got enough money to get my real estate license and that's everything that led up to like, okay, now I'm really in real estate. That was kind of the backstory there. Got it. No, it's perfect. I'm curious how the building the real estate, um, you know, you own a, a brokerage. We'll, we'll get into that now, but like the actual selling of the real estate overlaps with the investing of the real estate because there's, we've talked to some agents who are like, they have this, this thought kind of like you did, oh, I got to become an agent. And then when they hear the deals that the people are doing that, who they're helping, they're like, oh, I got to get on that side of it. Right. So like, I'm curious on like the overlap between the investing that you do and, and the, the sales that you do and how those kind of parlay off each other. Yeah, for sure. Well, to be honest with you, and I think this is what kind of holds people from taking the first step is like, there wasn't a lot of thought process. Like you're saying, well, how did you think about this? I'm like, I really didn't. I just said, real estate, I heard someone made 25 grand. It doesn't seem that hard. Get my license. I'll figure out how to do that. Got my license and said, okay, well, what's next? And so you're not looking like too far out at like having to know everything. I just knew, hey, if I have a license, I can make money in real estate. So the investing side, you know, what's funny is that when I got into the business, I truly thought everyone owned real estate. I didn't I, like, I thought every agent had doors. I was like, oh yeah, everyone's like a property owner. You have a four plus. Like I was, fr and then I found out like, actually it's the opposite. Most don't. And, and then I was like, well, why? Like if, if you're studying and selling these assets every day, how come you don't own them? And like, they get more valuable over time. They produce cash flow, tax write, like all these different benefits. And I found out very early on that most people don't make enough money in real estate to really invest in real estate. And then my next question was, well, why? And I found out that it's because if you want to run a successful real estate business, the key word is business. And it doesn't happen overnight. It's something that you have to continue to grow and kind of like the 1% better every day type of thing. And I, I figured out that, oh, okay, that's interesting. I really have to get my active income up before I start focusing on the passive income. Because if I don't get the active income up and just learn how to make real money selling real estate, I'm not who the investment stuff's not going to come. And so that's what my focus was very early on is like, hey, I want to invest, but like I'm not really fixated on $500 of cash flow every month. I want to make $50,000 this month. So that was like my mindset in the first couple of years was just, Hey, focus on the active right now. And we'll get to the other stuff when we get there. Yeah, totally. Uh, it's funny that you say that a lot of, we, you know, we've worked with several agents. We have some go-tos now, but it, we, we learned in the process because we're not on the agent side that you're right. A lot of these agents almost are like, it's not like it's foreign to them, but they're kind of like, yeah, they have all this access to all this, you know, the MLS to sellers, to builders, to all these things. And they just kind of don't take advantage of it. But I do, I, 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 I think exactly what you said is correct because I read a stat the other day that was like, I think 90% 
of of realtors, you know, they don't make enough money to like even support themselves because a lot of people get in the business, right? That stat might not be a hundred percent correct, but it's a it's a big majority of them don't make enough money where that ten percent is just crushing it, right? I mean, do you see that in that field where it's like the people that the cream that rises to the top is really doing all the deals? Because you're not going to refer to somebody, you're not going to refer someone to someone who's done two or three deals, right? You got to build your way up, just like anything. Yeah, I mean, eighty seven percent statistically, eighty seven percent of agents that get their real estate license today will not be in the business five years from today. I think that's what I, I think that's what I I read. Yeah. yeah, it was something like that. Yeah, and that's that's a lot. That's a lot of churn, right? Um, but you know what's even more shocking is is that you know, and and I don't want to throw out the number because it'll probably I'm not a hundred percent certain, but it's staggering once I actually learned about it. How many people do not actually interview more than one agent before trusting them with their buyer, you know, their buyer transaction or selling a home. And so you always wonder like, well, how do you even get business if you literally sold one home per year for the last five years? And you just be shocked how many people don't do their due diligence when it comes to hiring a real estate professional. It's staggering. I think it's like, I want to say 80 or 70 or 80% of people won't interview more than two agents or won't interview more than one agent um, when yeah. they sell their home. I kind of learned this the hard way when I bought my first house. I realized that the person I was working with was a rookie and we ended up getting the deal done. But and then I realized, you know, not, you know, it's kind of like anything. Not everyone is super great at their job. And that's kind of what I want to pivot into. Like, how did you become, and this works in any field. This works if you're a personal trainer. This works if you're an agent. This works if you're trying to build a business. Like, how did you become proficient at it enough that you could not only support yourself, but go from supporting yourself to thriving and then using that money to then invest in real estate? Like, what was there? I know you said you didn't think about it a lot in the beginning, but I assume that there was some sort of thing you latched onto to get yourself to be proficient. Yeah. Well, you know, so it's kind of, it's, I kind of always, again, try not to think too far out ahead. And so once I really made the commitment, now I, I went through the whole thing of went broke, had to ask my dad for some money. Like I struggled my first year until I really just ended up turning it on and being like, okay, I'm letting all of the, you know, preconceived notions about real estate. I am actually broke. So I'm not going to act like I'm not broke. I am broke. Let's just go ahead and roll with that. And once I kind of just stopped caring what other people thought, I said, well, I have to talk to a lot of people. Like that, I, I just like, I'm, I'm getting an email every other week about real estate. This isn't going to cut it. Like I'm showing one home per month. This isn't going to work. How do I increase that? And so that's all I focused on was how do I increase the amount of conversations I'm having on a daily basis? And it's just simple action. And from there, I was like, okay, cool. Now I'm talking to a lot of people. That's great. Like, why are they not buying homes or wh what's going on? And so it's just kind of like, it all started with the basics and you just kind of work from there. But the point that I'm trying to make is that you want to get proficient in real estate. Everything you want to know in real estate is on the other side of transactions. Meaning that all the stuff you want to learn, they're like, well, I don't know how the negotiation, the title company, what does this mean? And the closing, and all, all that stuff you only learn by getting clients and going through it with them. There is no other way to learn it. So a lot of agents will put the car before the horse. They're worried about all this stuff. I'm like, hey, you want to know how you learn it? Well, you talk to a thousand sellers this year, 1,000 of them. And trust me, you will learn everything on the other side that you want to know, but it's all going to come from actually doing the deals. Bottom line. I think it's very, this is why I said it pertains to so many professions, right? Like how do you become good at personal training? Well, you take on clients and you figure out what they need from you and you might fail a few times. And then you, and I, I only picked that cause it was just in the back of my head, but like, how do you become a good investor? Well, you buy some deal, you have enough in money in reserves. You try to go out and buy some deals. Maybe they don't work. Maybe they do work. As long as you don't lose your shirt and, and everything you own, you can probably figure out a way to pivot and then you know, build it from there. And that's kind of what we did. Like our first couple of deals were decent. One of them was great. One of them burned yeah. down. Like it's, you know, it's just part yeah, of the game. So that. yeah, yeah, exactly. I think uh, more people than I've realized have, have, have had that. But so talk to me about when you got, you know, enough kind of um, moves or, or tools in the tool belt to start investing and like what strategies you ended up going after once you realized that like, Okay, I, I I have I'm established. I'm not broke anymore. Um, you know, I, I know you talk a lot about seller financing, so I'm curious if that's yeah. like a newer a newer 
trend, not trend, but a newer tactic for you or have you kind of got in that way? Yeah, well, I'll start, I'll end with seller financing. Um, so, you know, it, I always knew I was going to invest in real estate. I knew that was the plan. And once I had enough money sitting in the bank account, I was like, okay, yeah, now probably is a good time to to stash some of this cash away before I just blow it on something stupid, right? So, you know, I think for me, the investing side, I was so bored with the concept of buy a house, buy another one, buy three houses, you know, long-term rentals. I was just like so bored. I was, this is, this is, this, this can't work. Like this is boring. It takes like, take forever to build this. And so I tried literally everything else but that. And, and, and so I tried flipping houses. We tried, we did some wholesale stuff. We were even in property management. And then I just got back to said, you know what? I don't want to work for the same dollar twice anymore. And what I meant by that is, you know, I'm making all this money selling real estate. And don't get me wrong, I'm busting my ass doing it. I'm working a lot. It's a startup business. And then I'm shoveling this money into this property management company or shoveling this money into this flip. And then I have to go like put on my property management boots or put on my flip boots and go work on that project to make sure I get that money back. And I'm like, this, this, is, this isn't going to work. And so what do you know? I reverted back to buy and hold. Because number one, anything I bought and sold, I deeply regret it, deeply regret selling it. But everything I hung on to have all been winners. And I was like, hey, I only have so much time. What is my investment strategy going to be based on how I want to live? I want to run up my active income as high as I possibly can. And I want to take those profits and invest in something that doesn't cost more of my time. And that was long-term rentals for me. So that's kind of how the strategy, I figured it out for myself. Now that's what works for me. That may not be for an active investor. That's probably not the, maybe not the best strategy, but that's how it worked for me. That's how I figured it out. And then seller financing, you know, interestingly enough, I think I picked it up pretty early on. Um, I think it's a great tool everybody should know about. Again, tools in the tool belt. It's not every single deal, but knowing when the deal is right to use it, it's, it's a very powerful financial tool. Um, I picked it up really early on and, you know, bought some deals that way. And I was like, wow, this is super easy. I'd have to put any money down. Basically, there's no bank involved. This was really easy. And as I got better and better at it, you know, you just get better. You learn the different skills, tactics, just how to find the deals. Um, and it's something that I, I talk to agents a lot about because a lot of them, they don't, their taxes aren't in order. A lot of them, like you didn't have a hard time showing enough income to get a loan on a half a million dollar deal. So um, it for me, it was like, hey, how do I avoid having to go through all that mess? I just want to buy the deal. I don't want to have to go through all that. That was how I learned seller financing. And that's why I think, especially for agents, it's it's crucial to know. I mean, for a variety of reasons, but for personal investment, I think it's essential. Yeah, absolutely. So when you're buying deals now or in the recent past, if just talk to me about like your strategies, is it through seller financing? Are you finding these deals on market because you have access to, uh, you know, to be, because you're an agent, like what's your maybe more tactical strategy of, of buying? I realize that you're talking about seller financing, but I'm curious, like how you're finding the deals. Are you calling sellers on expired listings? Are you like, what's the, what's the move? Yeah. So you know, it's kind of a combination of all of them. Obviously, having you know a, a good amount of sales agents that are with that work with our company, that are partnered with us, there's deal flow from that. But the best deals have been identifying the ideal client, the ideal avatar for seller financing. And for us, it's the mom and pop investor who is been kicking the tax can down the road, as we all are for or most of us, and. They're tired of dealing with the property management. They're self-managing, right? And they don't want to take all their funds at once, but they definitely want to get some income coming in passively on a monthly basis. And a lot of people are outliving their savings. They're outliving the amount of money they have. So they're like, well, how do I capitalize one last time on this 100, 200, half a million dollars of equity? And, and seller financing presents a great win-win scenario. Those have been our absolute best deals, have been finding that person. So talk to us a little bit about this. I think maybe 
a little more context for people. Um, if you could give an idea of a deal that you've done, for example, you give maybe one of your best deals that you've done on the seller financing side and, and kind of how, take us through the whole process. I think a lot of it goes down to like finding the deal, walking through it, analyzing it, you know, kind of yeah. maybe don't stretch it out too far, but um, put a bow on it for us. So three things, and there's more than this, obviously, but the big three with seller financing, and I, this is how we analyze it, is I got to find a big win. I got to find a big win with these three categories. One, down payment. Two, interest rate. Three, sales price. Okay. One of those has to be a major W and bonus points if two of them can be a W, right? Two wins out of those three. But if none of those are a win, it's not a seller financing deal for me. It's just not like, I, there's no advantage. I might as well just go to the bank. There's no upside for me doing this. So I'll give you an example of a deal. This isn't the best one, but it's the most recent one. It's pretty good, but it's also kind of, it's it just gives you a good way to think about those big three. So uh, Triplex, the avatar client I described earlier, exact to a T, the exact fit. Property rents are a little bit under rent. They're under rented a little bit. They could probably bump up maybe 20% or so, maybe a little bit more. And uh, two of the units are vacant. One is occupied. Um, the last straw for her was one of the tenants who was a uh, Section 8 tenant. Um, she barricaded herself in the house. And the actual, like, I think it was either the SWAT team or the police team, like, kicked in the door. So they <laughs> broke the door, broke the the uh, the metal screen. And, I mean, kind of, you know, they just go and destroy your stuff and leave. That's how they roll. And so they were just like, oh, we're just done with this. And so we we were, we were looking at it, and they were throwing out numbers. Um, it was probably worth about 400000 if it was fully rented and, and rents where they needed to be. They were throwing out numbers in the 370s, 380s. And we just told them, like, look, what best we can do is, is around the 325 mark. It's the best. And they're like, well, we're going to need a significant amount of money down. And I'm like, oh, God, here, okay. Well, how much? And I'm thinking in my head, like, they want 200 grand down or something. I'm like, this is not going to work. And they said 75. And I'm like, okay, so you want $75,000 down. Let's think about this. Is that a win on a seller financing deal worth three fifty, four hundred? dollars Not really. That's not a win down payment. So it's, a, it's a big down payment. Purchase price, we were talking about three twenty five. dollars The property is worth four hundred dollars at least four hundred dollars right now. So $75,000 worth of equity, that's a win right off the bat. And the interest rate, we negotiated it to a 4%. So interest rate, again, I know we're kind of all spoiled now. It's like, oh, we only got a 4% in a seven rate environment. Like, gosh, but 4% isn't like the best rate I've ever gotten on a seller finance deal, but it's pretty good. So I looked at that deal and go, well, $75,000 plus a new roof, which it needed, is not very uh, appetizing to me. However, $75,000 in, then increase in $75,000 of equity day one and at 4%, that was a seller finance deal for us. And we closed on it. Um, we're getting estimates right now and offers from other investors for around 450 on that deal. So we think we potentially added a hundred thousand dollars of, of upside. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I, Rye like made eye contact with me because he's like you got to tell him about this deal that we're working on right now that's not a deal anymore but it's it's funny you mentioned those three things interest rate price down payment are those are the three things yep. you mentioned the, the yep. big th and, i call them the big three when we coach about self yeah financing. big three and <laughs> i'm having this conversation and what i realize is that there's varying degrees of motivated motivation there's varying degrees right. of motivated sellers and i found somebody who wants to do business with me but he's not motivated and in in, in, in that world Nobody can really, one person can win, but not both. And he yeah. wants to win. And I, we got to this point where it's like a $250,000 house close to me, which is not, it's a two bed, one bath. It's a small house, but we were trying to get a deal done. And he goes, yeah, I need $50,000 down. Um, you know, I, I pay full market value. And I'm like, okay, if two of those things work, then, you know, give me a 1% interest rate. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he's like, well, sure. interest rates are like seven and a half. And he's like, and I, and my initial response to him, I was like, 
So I should just go to the bank. Why am I, what's the seller, what's seller financing about this? I'll just, I'm, I'm kind of yeah. wasting my time. So, you know, I learned as work, we were calling on expired listings, um, withdrawn listings, and then you know, for sale by owner. And he happened to be for sale by owner. Um, and it was, it was um, free and clear, hence seller financing. But, you know, it's funny getting to the actual motivation. That person that you're talking about was seriously motivated. They had somebody barricaded in their house, right? This guy has, I, as I learned after talking to him, he's got 25 units. He's like, ah, I'm just trying to offload, you know, like I have a bunch yeah. paid off. I'm like, mm, okay, sounds great. But if it's not going to be a deal for me, it's like, what, what are we even doing? So and when people are listening to this, this episode, I think it's important to, to note the reason that you were able to get that deal is because this person, you're trying to solve this problem for this person. I, on the other hand, was just trying to get a deal done with somebody who's not that motivated. And hence, I don't think it's going to work out, but he's somebody that maybe he, he gets motivated at some point. So I'll stay in touch, but I wanted to bring that up. Yeah. I, just to piggyback off that, it's interesting. We, we kind of just talked about kind of our strategy and what we were working through. Can you talk about the deal flow and kind of how you guys are going and sourcing deals because that's like getting leads is, is a huge part of the business. And then not only leads, but motivated leads. That's what we've really uncovered. Yeah. It's like a lot of people just aren't motivated. Right. And when, especially when yeah. you're doing the outbound calls, they're getting a million different calls from whether it's agents, other investors, whatever. Right. And they're just over encumbered with these calls because they're on the same list. So I'm wondering if you guys do something different where you're actually able to uncover people that are actually motivated. So like, I think that you have to extend your timeline horizon as a long-term investor, not only for the returns of your property, but like when you're going to close a lead from the time you talk to them to when you close them. That example that I just gave you now, this is extreme, but I, you just reminded me that property I've known about since 2013. I finally bought it 10 years later, 10 years. Yeah. I actually... Uh, used in college, I used to manage that property for that owner. Um, I would go and like collect the rents and cash and then give it to them. They'd give me 10% of that. Like I used to do that in college to pay for like Panda Express and like beers that night. Like that was my way of earning some money. And so 10 years later, I finally off. bought Not it. Not to cut the story ahead, off because I want you to get back to it. But like, did you actually CRM style keep in touch with this person for 10 years? Like how did that come back into the fold? Because uh, that's some serious persistence. Like what, what, what was the story? Yeah. So it was like three years ago. Um, so my dad, I think he told you he's a contractor and he's just a super nice guy. Like he builds custom homes. Like if you're a sweet old lady and you need help with your house, like he'll send one of his guys. Like, so he had done some work for them and she had called him and said her husband had died. This is three years ago and that she needs some work. And if she could help, if he could help her with some of the stuff at the property, my dad's like, yeah, no problem. Of course, you know, I'll help you out. She was telling him, yeah, like this is getting a little bit, it's kind of a lot to manage. And my dad was telling me this and I'm like, dude, do you think she wants to sell it? And, and she ended up, you know, it wasn't the right time, but yeah, three years stayed steadily. Like, Hey, check in with Susie, like see where she's at. And then we just caught her on the right day after the SWAT team blew in one of the doors at the rentals. She was like, her daughter actually was the one who was like, I'm done with this property. Like I get it. I want her gone. And so, um, yeah. so not CRM style, but I will say like my deal flow actually comes from, it comes better from referrals because I tell people what I'm looking for. I talk about seller financing. I tell every agent I talk to, which I know a ton of them in the markets I buy. I'm like, dude, put me on your list. I'm always looking for seller financing stuff. I can pay pretty close to retail. Obviously, I got to get some terms, right? But I can, I'm not over here lowballing people. I can, I can give people good, good prices if they're willing to, you know, wait a little bit on, and, and, and do a seller financing deal. So a lot of it is warm referral stuff. And yeah, we do track a lot of it. Um, but, you know, I have a couple of guys in my office and I have a good friend of mine who would be really good investor if you guys are ever looking for one in Albuquerque on creative finance. He's one of the best. And what we, what my guys do and what his team does is we use a couple different systems. Reonomy is one of them. And what they do for prospecting is they ju we just scrub the avatar the best we possibly can. Owned it for more than 10 years minimum. We usually shoot for like 20 years, 10, 20 years ownership. Um, absentee owner works. If they're, that means they're, they're not in, a, they're in another state. Um, we want an extremely high amount of equity. So they're like 20, 20% 20 debt, if not less on the property. 
Um, and that, and then if it's in a trust or it's been transferred at all, even better. And those are the properties we look at. That's the ones we go in, in our different zip code with our size of property and price point. Those are the people we talk to because we've kind of been like, you know, for me, that was what I want to buy. I don't want to buy anything else. I don't want your flip. I don't want, I don't want to deal with the wholesale. It's just not my model. I want deals like the one I described to you. I could do one every three to four months and be completely cool. That's so, fine with me. So one every three to four months, are you, what's the exit strategy on these? Are you just buying these and then keeping them as long-term rentals? Or are you doing rent to own? I know there's a lot of ways to, to, to offload these yeah. at the end of the day. I'm curious how you run your shit. Yeah. So we're not, um, we're not really looking to sell anything at the moment. So yeah, we're just buying and holding them. And what we, what we like to do, like with that specific deal, like that deal it didn't fit the best like numbers. Now we made a good amount of money, but I don't like to use 75 grand unless it's a, you know, if it was a million dollar house, okay, it's a little bit different. But this, the down payment wasn't ideal plus a new roof. I think all in we're close to 90,000 on it, but we, it appreciated by about a hundred thousand dollars or at least from what we bought it for to what it's worth today. So if we were to do a refinance on that, we would get about $50,000 back. So, that one wasn't a great deal, but we look for value add where we know in three to five years when we go to refinance that we're going to be able to get all of our money back. It's like an extended, it's like an extended burr, if that makes sense. Like it's just not a burr in one year. It's like if we can burr out of it in five years, great. And we just keep recycling our capital that way. So that's, that's really our um, idea, um, our concept. But if we can get a deal that has good enough interest rate terms and down payment terms, I don't care about the value add. But if those aren't great, then I definitely care about the value add. Cause the price, like it's hard to get, it's hard to get down payment and get interest rate, a good interest rate and get a good price. Like the price is usually gonna be anchored pretty high. I'll take the rest. So it's really hard to have a value add component in those types of deals, if that makes sense. Yeah, you got it. It's the yin and yang there. So. Uh, what does your portfolio look like now and what are your future goals with it as we move into 24, 25 or 25 and beyond? Yeah, for sure. So it's spread out between 17 different properties. Um, some are in New Mexico and some are in Toledo, Ohio, actually. Um, we have been also uh, haven't pulled the trigger on anything yet, but have some pretty cool, um, some pretty cool deals being put in front of us in St. Louis right now. Um, and we ventured out into these other markets because as a real estate professional being self-employed, uh, I actually at some point need to buy real estate. It's not about the cash flow. I mean, obviously you want to make good investments, but for tax purposes. And so in our market in Albuquerque, our local, mar our, our home market, just nothing could pencil. I just can't pencil a deal. Like it just doesn't make sense. Cash flow and interest rate. I mean, Unless you steal a seller finance deal, but those are hard. It takes a while to get those, the best, the good ones. So we started venturing off into other cash on cash return markets, like Ohio was one of them, um, because we just needed to buy stuff. Um, so we bought we bought ten properties there. That makes sense. Yeah, I feel like that's happening in uh, kind of the border of the United States, if you will, right? Maybe not the northern border, but you know, if you're anywhere near the East Coast, Southeast, Southwest, yeah. West Coast, it's really hard to make deals work. And that's why the creativity comes into play. I know a lot of people that are going to the Midwest, you kind of, you kind of, um, you know, you, you bite the bullet, I should say, on the appreciation side for a lot of those properties, but there's still great opportunities for value add as well as cash flow. So that's exciting that you're able to, to maneuver your way into a different market. And you say, we like, how did you get to that new market? Is that just creating relationships with, with lenders yeah. and, and agents and just being in the business for as long as you have? Yeah. I mean, it's um, obviously I kind of knew the type of asset we were looking for and yeah, I mean, a lot of studying, a lot of Zillow, a lot of phone calls, property management, vendors, contractors, agents, like really trying to get a feel for it. If you have somebody local who's non-biased, who could just tell you straight up, hey, I know this is what the crime report says. And I know what this says, but like, these are the areas stay away from or go into, or here's what's happening. You know, looking at the demographic is the, what's the population doing over the last year or two, over the last five years, 10 years. You know, what companies are there? What companies are planning on going there? 
you just look at all of those things and, and pick your market. And I, I found out what was easier for me was to pick one that fit all of the criteria I was looking for and then just focus on that. I see a lot of guys who I have friends of mine and it's just different investment strategies. They got like a property in like five different states. And I'm like, that's cool, but it's just so much information to take in and you're just so spread out with deal flow. I personally prefer consolidating to one place, really feeling like I'm learning it and then go deep in that market and sit there yeah. for a little while. That's kind of why we, we recommend, not always, but it depends. Like if you live in New York City, you know, you're not investing in New York City unless you're, you know, multi, multi-millionaire. Um, but we always recommend people to try to start in their backyard. And, and the reason why I bring this up is because I've lived in Philly for 12 years. And if you say the word Kensington to people that don't live in Philly that know it, they might have seen it on like murder capital of the world or like heroin capital of the world or some crazy crime show. And while that is true, the gentrification that's going on in that area and the, the opportunity now, not 10 years ago, but now to actually live there. And I mean, like Kensington, there are areas that are north of that that are still terrible, but like there's borderline places that like, if, if I don't live here, you know, you just assume things. Right. And that's very similar sure. to what you were saying, Ramona, like about like, you know, if you have somebody that's boots on the ground that can get you the information that Zillow or some website niche.com or whatever is not telling you, I think that's right. your competitive advantage. It's that creating those, those relationships and having a great property manager can be that because they want to build their client base. So they want to give you the best information and they're only going to tell you about properties that they would potentially manage hence building their, their business. So yeah. create a relationship it, with a property manager. That's what I would do. It's, it's, it's just the concept of going deep before you go wide. I mean, I've learned that the hard way with a lot of things, but yeah, just focusing on one thing that I'm going to get right and then go from there. So what are, let's say you're starting over today. Like, uh, and, and I always think about this question too, like how I would answer it because um, you know, we've bought property over the last six years, you know, a few in 2018, a couple in 2018, 2020, 2021. I bought my most recent in 2023. I have not bought a property in 2024. We've done some larger scale properties at the end of 2023. We haven't bought anything in 24, right? Mm -hmm. No, yeah. we haven't. So when, it, when if people ask the question, like, what are, what would you do today with the, the volatility and the interest rates and all this stuff? How would you answer that? Like, how, how would you not start over, but if you were like, Hey, I want, I want to buy my first five properties. What, what advice would you give to someone who's looking to do that? So someone who's looking to buy their first five properties, if that was me, how would I have done it? Um, it's a good question. I, well, put it this way. I think this applies for being a business owner, which I was running a, a independent brokerage when I was 24. So I had about 60 agents. Um, and so I kind of got the whole crash course into business and I think there's a lot of similarities in business and investing. I think they're really the same thing. And what I would have done differently is I would have actually listened to the people who gave me the tried and true models that I thought were boring or like just seemed too simple. I would have mastered the skill sets of what those business models required before I added any of my own creativity, any of my own ideas on top of the recipe, if you will. It's like follow the recipe first before you start trying to throw in your own special ingredients. A lot of times I would throw in my own special ingredients day one with a little bit of the proven recipe. I would have done it the opposite way and really tried to listen to what older people that had done this way longer than I have, what they were telling me works. I would have mastered those fundamentals first and then got creative after. Cool. Makes perfect sense. Um, that was kind of good. I don't, know, I don't know. I don't know if that was, I don't know if that was what you're looking for at the investing, but like, that's, you know, that's, if I could have done it different and buy my first five properties, I would have just listened and done it the, like the simple boring way that I was taught instead of trying to do it the way I ended up doing it. Yeah. I think I, I appreciate the answer. Cause I think a lot of times, um, people, you try different strategies and you try different. We know things. we have. Yeah, you know? exactly. And so, but you, it's funny. It always comes kind of full circle. Not always, but a lot of times it does. And for us, kind of the same boat. Like we tried Airbnb, tried the syndication model, tried, um, I mean, just, we uh, still do all those things. Right. But like, what's our focus now? Right. Right. Like, it, yeah. It's like you, you mentioned like, that's like casting a wide net, right? You're trying everything. Yeah. And then until you find something that you're like the true and tried and you come back to square one. And I'm not saying we're not doing those other things, but it's just interesting that 
it all led you back to the same road. And you're like, Hey, listen, if I could have just gone back in time, I would have mastered the fundamentals. Cause yeah. I think a lot of times people try the other things because, and not just within real estate, but like, because it's sexy or because they, they see someone getting a crazy amount of return and they just go off into this other sphere where they don't really need to. And I think it's, we get uh, kind of masked by, Oh man, I don't want to wait 10, 20, 30 years, but that's real estate. A lot of the times, like, even unless yeah. you get into flipping and you're, you're using that active yeah. income to then reinvest into long term, it's just very interesting because um, we've gotten this advice from people that are 50, 60, right? Not in our age bracket that they're like, dude, just just keep chugging away. It's not going to happen overnight. You'll have some big wins a lot of the time, but I think social media makes you feel like you're less adequate. I think when you're going along in your story and like a lot of people, even just getting to one, two units is a struggle for people, right? They have to increase that active income just to be able to deploy it, to learn it. There's only... You don't, you can only learn so much from the books. It's going through those experiences and, and yeah. having the wins and the losses to actually get there. So I appreciate the best. Yeah. And yeah. It's, to go off that, it's, it almost, it's like, I say it's never been easier to do what we're doing right now, but it's also never been harder to stay focused on one thing. And we are guilty of that shiny object syndrome as well. Like you see people, you talk to people, like we interview people every Wednesday or the podcast drops every Wednesday. And we get so jacked up about what this person is talking about because we're trying to interview successful entrepreneurs that sometimes we're like, okay, after the episode, we're like, all right, we can't go down this path because we've already started down this one. It's like, should we do that? Should we do this? So, you know, consumerism in America and having all of this information right at your fingertips can be a great thing, but can also kind of distract you too. And I think that's, yep. to me, that's a, that's a struggle. That's a hard thing to, to get your brain around. I will say if you're young, just do anything. It doesn't, it doesn't fucking matter. Just do something and you'll kind of figure out your way. But I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that, like not getting distracted along the way. I do. This has been a struggle for me for years. Um, one thing specifically that's helped me a ton is deleting social media off your phone. Now I still use it. I still get on there. I still have like, I got, you know, posts and content, all that stuff. But man, the clear, even though it sounds so stupid, the clarity you have throughout the day when you're not, you're not constantly interrupting your thought process with someone else's shit that has nothing to do with you or relevant at all. It's, it's staggering. It was staggering to me how like when I really sit there and think about a problem for long enough and I have something just on my mind, it might take a day. It might take two days. It might take two weeks. I'll eventually come up with the right, like I, it just how much deeper you can go in your own thought process when it's not constantly interrupted is a huge, is a huge benefit. Um, so that's one, not, not reaching for that phone and looking at and scrolling. That's for, like sometimes, so, I, I was going to say, I love that. And I'll tell you what, I am as guilty as it comes to that. Like I am so distracted. I mean, we are content creators. So are you though, bro. like, you know, you have content that you put out and I, I, I find how much time I'm spending on that. And it's not necessarily scrolling. It's kind of like strategizing, but it's still time that I could block and not be doing yeah. it for that full amount of time. I think Rise yeah. a lot better at it than I am. I'm just like... Yeah. And probably because he has a child. It just brings <laughs> so, it, truthfully, it's it's becoming like, it brings so much anxiety to your life too. 100%. Because we have so many things going on on a daily basis. And, and just like, you know, I think as a human being, you're trying to, or anyone that's working a job and they're trying to, to start uh, an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial en uh, endeavor, multiple in income streams, businesses, family, relationships, everything, right? This whole thing is going through your head on a daily basis. And then you weave in social media and you see people that are driving around in the car that you want, or they have a bigger house than you do. And they're, they're, it looks like they're going on more vacations. And you're like, and you're like, how do I get there? I'm trying every single day to do the thing, to get to this yeah. level of the life that I want in my, in my brain, whatever that is. And I'm speaking for pretty much everybody. Yeah. It just becomes a cyclical cycle. And it's, it's crazy. I don't know, man. It's right. very hard to get shit done the way we used to get stuff done is just like, I used to be able to put my head down and go laser focus on something and just actually finish a project. Now I feel like I'm doing like 10% here, 20% here. I'm trying to do it on random hours. And I don't know if it's social media or not, but then you, like, it's almost like scatterbrained. Like I'm like a squirrel that sees a, an acorn. I'm like, dude, that looks exciting. That looks exciting. Let me try this. Let me try that. We should, we should weave this into the business. And it's so, so hard, I think. And I don't know if it's social media, but I'm, that's what I'm feeling lately is a lot of shiny it's, object syndrome. I, yeah. I think it's social media. I mean, I, and I think like at some point I, I was like, and I, by the way, I love where this conversation is going. Cause I, I think this is like cr crucial stuff. I could go down a, a tangent, but 
you have to almost at some point know, like, this is just a game. Like, this thing right here, this thing is just a game to get your attention so that marketers can pay more money to be on the site. The longer you look at it, it is designed every which way to keep your eyeballs on it. That's what it's designed to do. At some point, you have to real. You can't get played by the game. You can play the game. You just can't get played by. It. You have to start realizing, like, hey, these things are actually not set up to help me succeed. They're actually set up to do the opposite. Now, I don't want to get too far onto the into the weeds on this, but like, they're they're not meant. They're not meant for guys like what we're talking about to who want to build wealth, who want to be financially independent, who want to take care of their families and not need any assistance from anyone, be 100% self-sustainable and wealthy and smart and educated and have their own opinions. That's not what social media is designed to help you do. It's quite the opposite. So I, I think it's crucial that like you don't play that. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it's, 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 I forget what I was watching. It came down to like literally the fact that these little bubbles above the uh, icons are red with the with the one and the two and the, the notifications, right? That everything like that everything that that has a um, intrinsic design. I don't know if intrinsic is the right word, but like it's designed to get you. And I'm the type of person like I if I have two emails, I'm deleting them. Like they're not like I I'm playing into it. Like I know I yeah. I uh, was looking at my girlfriend's phone the other day. She and it was like she had like seventy thousand emails, and I'm like what are you doing? And she's like, oh, I don't care. I'm like, I wish I didn't care. Like, how do you, you know, how do you not like, so anyway, it's, 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 I'm getting played, Ramon. I'm getting played. So anyway, it's just, well, well, it's, it's the daily loop of that too. Yeah. I think uh, I was listening to something today. I forget what it was, but you get into these loops in your business too, though, from social media, because someone's doing a different strategy. Maybe they're paying a ton for ads. Maybe they're, they're cold calling. Maybe they're going on Facebook and you're like, let me try this and weave this in. And you're thinking you're, it's information overload and you're drinking out of a fire hose. And it's, it's so hard. I, I probably brought this back to five minutes ago, but like to get through and punch through the, the, the noise is so incredibly yeah. difficult. And then go to your email. You're like, Oh, let me check this to see if someone is going to email me saying they have a million dollars for me. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> why am I checking my email so much? I don't give a shit about what the, what, who is trying to reach out to me, but it always, you always, you're searching you're like, Oh, maybe something's exciting. And then you delete the email. Another one comes in. We just spend so much time. If, if it was tracked, I know they track it on the apps, but if you could track how much time it is clearing your inbox, checking the DMS, uh, just scrolling down to see the newest feed posts, just like so much stuff or checking your, um, uh, checking your 401k, checking your brokerage, checking all this, like think about how much time we spend on our phone, checking all the BS where we could be focused on, you know, moving the business forward, doing this and just being more boots on the ground and, and like also living front facing. It, it, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> like we all, we all think this is going to get us to the life that we want to live and we're just wait, you know, wasting. We're going to get there away. and then be back on the phone. Yeah. On the phone. Yeah. It's actually so it, frustrating. It, it, talking about the phone, it. Exactly. It's pissing me it, off. It, it, it <laughs> is. Yeah, by the way, it so is. this is funny. I'm glad this is recording. We needed to have this conversation. Ryan and I were frustrated, not with each other, just in general before we got on this call. And I think to me, I was frustrated because of actually this conversation I'm having. I feel like there's just so much. I'm trying to like rein it all in, but you know, kind of back to our convo. It's just funny that we ended up taking here yeah. back to our convo. La one of the last questions we like to ask, unless you had something else to say on that remind, I didn't want to cut you off, but I do have, you, you, you know, I'll send you a video after we get, after we finish up today that uh, about the concept of maker and manager time schedules. It was a huge, it was a huge value add for me. Um, blocking time, like truly blocking four hours with zero distractions. So you can focus on moving your business forward and like understand that balance of like, yeah, you have to be a manager at some point. Like you have to take calls like this. I take all my stuff on Tuesdays. Like that's just what I do Monday and Tuesday or meetings day. Everything else is blocked. Like not an hour block, but like four hour blocks at a time where do not schedule anything because on this time I need to do X. And when you start limiting the distractions here and, and email and all that stuff, like I said, the power of like sitting with your thoughts about on one subject for an extended period of time, four hours is considered an extended period of time these days. Uh, it, it's, it's just, it's crazy how much impact that's made. I'll send it to you guys, but the, I wanted to do something tangible on like the guy who's, or a uh, guy or gal who's hearing this right now and is like, yeah, I resonate with that. Every, like there's so many things. I'm like, look, here's the, here's the truth. It all works. So 
don't don't qu- don't trick yourself. Every strategy you've heard today, they all work, but they're not all going to work if you try them all. Only one's going to work, but you got to stick with that one thing. And usually, just use a round number here. There's ten skill sets that you need to have to master. Let's just call it Airbnb arbitrage. I know nothing about this, but I'm sure there's 10 things you got to learn how to do. Number one, you got to figure out like, what's the financial model? Number two, what type of properties? I got to reach out to the owners. I got to figure out how to pitch them. I got to have all my leasing language down. I got to figure out how to deal with like all these different things to master Airbnb arbitrage, right? But the problem is, is that you start on number one, you maybe get to number two if you're lucky, and then either... You think, oh, this is too hard. It's not scalable, blah, 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 blah. Or you say, oh, RV storage parks. Yeah, that actually sounds better. And you jump to the next thing. So really, you only get maybe two of the three skill sets. And then you just move to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So you end up knowing a little bit about everything, but you're not a master at any of it. And it's because, again, either you convince yourself that this isn't the thing that's going to make you a shitload of money and you move on to the next, or it's because that the the skill sets required needed you stopped it was too hard it was like i I, i'm gonna quit and so you have these like half baked d ideas in all these different areas and so what i always tell myself is like i tell myself that so i'm like okay that's where i'm at here the only way to master it is to get reps i gotta get the repetition i have to do it over and over and over and over and while everybody else does exactly what I just described. I'm going to keep chipping away at this one thing. And it takes a lot to be an expert. And I think people forget that because of looking at social media, there's some 24 year old kid who's raking in a million dollars a month in Airbnb arbitrage. And you're like, shit, it hasn't happened for me yet. It's been six months. I'm like, dude, that shit is fake. It's not real. And if it is, it's one in a million. (laughs) So your odds are very low here. And so oh, yeah, I just want to yeah. throw that out there. It's like, it's just, I can resonate with that a lot because I've been there and it's a I constant, think, you know, you're always working on that. It's a mental battle, dude. I th- and first of all, and then, you know, you weave partners in, you weave employees in and like everybody has a different way of working too. Like think about, and it's just hard and you're like managing that. And so, um, I, I don't know. It, it's the whole thing's a struggle. I will say that was probably one of the most real ways to break it down. Yeah. Cause I think that, I think that every single person, at least an entrepreneur that's listening to that can relate in one aspect of another, because you think about your marketing, you think about your lead gen, you think about uh, client retention. Like there's so many things within that. Right. And then you get good at a couple and you're like, dude, I hate this one. So I'm not going to do it when you, but you have to do it even, you know, cause it's part yeah. of those 10. It's just so interesting. I think I'm gonna get a shirt that says half baked because that's how I feel like pretty much every day. <laughs> yeah. uh, because of this <laughs> like half baked model that you mentioned. And I, it's funny to, to say it, but it sucks and you go through it. The best one the best one is when people say that it's not scalable. That's the best one because it's like it's not scalable because you don't know how to scale it. That that's that's the bottom line. And Also, mind you, for things that are super hard to scale, there's extremely large rewards for figuring out how to scale it. (laughs) Like, like, so, but that's another one. It's like, oh, I don't see this being a big thing. It's like, well, you don't see it being a big thing because you don't know how to make it a big thing. And that's usually what we're paying is we're paying some sort of like ignorance tax, right? It's like I'm paying every day by losing out on opportunity because I don't have the right information to go act upon it. And so- a lot of times you have to ask yourself, am I just making an excuse that it's not this or it's not that, or have people actually done it? And I'm just not willing to commit to learn it all the way. It's a big difference. That right there, that right there is the, the solve for that is the rooms you're in. I think yeah, that that's the solve for that. Cause it's like, okay, if I don't know how to do it, is there somebody out there that does great guaranteed? Cause that's what you're looking at on social media. How do I get in the rooms of those people that do, or that just make you think bigger in general? And that's, that's the story. I mean, that's the thing. Cause if, if you go at it alone, you can only go so far. If you go at it with one other person, you can go a little bit further, but if you're in a room or you're in a community of people that are going at it together or like bringing different ideas to the table, you get inspired and then yeah. you can act. I, part B of that, I will say is like the, the room analogy is great. The who, the who not how, and, and like, I, but I also think there's rooms you can get in that once again, brings you back to the same thing where you're like, that sounds exciting. That sounds exciting. That sounds I exciting. I do agree. I when do you agree with that. Narrow, like for me, you know, there's a couple different masterminds. We've tried a couple different masterminds and things and, and 
some of them have been just broad strokes, right? And you can pick a pillar that you want to work in. Then you find, you go another one. It's like stre- extremely narrow focus, but maybe it doesn't, it's not having, it doesn't have the exact tools that you feel like you need. I think a lot of it goes down to picking the one strategy, right? And understanding it's going to be a long time horizon and committing to that. Just saying, Hey, you pick this in the beginning because it has X, Y, Z benefits. And you think you're strong at this, like shut the door, lock yourself in and just go lock in on that. And then when you go into the rooms, find the rooms that the people, let's just call it creative finance. You want to get into real estate investing. You want to get into creative financing. You know, there's, there's a way to, to buy without you going to the banks and you're going directly to the seller, right? Find the people that are experts in that. And don't just surround yourself with one of them, surround yourself with multiple so you can get, but you're getting different thoughts on the same, same strategy or same, same lane, right? So that it doesn't, steer you off course. Maybe the strategies and the different loops that will kind of confuse you, but at least you'll know, Hey, listen, I'm not wavering from the strategy this time. And I'm going to commit to this. I'm going to learn all the different aspects about it. And then after X amount of time, then you can start getting creative within the niche. Kind of what you mentioned earlier in the episode, adding your own. Yeah. 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 And by the way, I could do a whole another hour on just this subject alone. Cause I could go for a day. I, I think it's like, I think it's the most relevant subject that someone who would be listening to this podcast, what's one of like the five pillars of things that they got to like master is not being distracted. Um, and that comes in everything we just mentioned. It comes in advice. It comes to social media. It comes from coaching. It comes from, you know, other people around you, what they're telling you. It comes in a variety of different ways. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I also could talk about this for hours too. I, I, we don't, I don't know if we've had many episodes where we've broken that down that way. So I appreciate, you know, your, your time and uh, we're winding down here. We just want to ask, I just want to ask one more question that I have not asked in a few, in a bunch of episodes, but because we got a little philosophical, um, I want to ask what your why is. So I don't know how, how old are you, by the way? 30. 30. Okay. We're, we say early thirties, but we're creeping up on the mid. You are. <laughs> 33 is not bad. No, no, it's not bad. I'm creeping, dude. <laughs> creeping up it does suck when you it's say not it not bad i That's didn't say it was bad i'm 32 he's 33 anyway uh so i asked that because sometimes we ask the question the, the person's like yeah i'm 21 and i'm like god damn i don't know how you're doing all this but we're a similar age our whys have shifted they've changed they've molded what is yours what gets you out of bed every morning like what what's the reason you do what you do what's the reason you you know all the pr- productivity hacks and you block time block and all these things that like to try to build a better life? I'm curious what you do it for. Yeah, I mean, I've been asked that question before and I, I still don't know if I have a, a, a very clear answer. But, you know, for me, it's it's just like the excitement of how far you could take it, like what the possibilities are. Like, it, it's just, you see proof all around you. And I like to put myself environment in environments where I see the proof daily. Scottsdale, Arizona, great place that I get to see the proof daily at what's possible. Um, I mean, my, my office sits right next to the, the Scottsdale private airport runway. So I get to see all the jets flying in and out every day. But uh, the, yeah, I think that's what it is. Just the excitement of like what could be and, and how far you could take it, what could happen. And that excitement, I've always been thrilled. Always got a thrill off of the big ideas and like land on Mars type of stuff. You know what I mean? Like that, I yeah. love those types of ideas and I love those types of people who are going for that stuff. And so for me, that's what keeps me excited and motivated is just yeah. the possibilities of what could be. Well, I'll tell you what, um, we're not going to be here that long. So you might as well go for it, right? Like the, we're in just a blip, man. It's just a blip. And I, I watched something the other day. <laughs> Some guy was like, yeah, how amazing is it that you get to be alive in this time? All these things, I mean, some's crazy, some's good, some's bad, but like all this stuff is going on and we get to yeah. experience it. And like, if you take a gratitude approach to it, like what are the possibilities? Like, I think yeah. that'll get you going and keep you going. So that's a good way to wrap this episode. This was awesome. Uh, I, I'm excited to meet you in person. We, we talked about it briefly. It's going to happen in October. So we're looking forward to it. Um, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? They want to network. They want to learn seller finance. They want to buy houses from you. What's the best way? Yeah. Even though, even though uh, I just said, I'm not on social media a lot, Instagram still the, like the best place. Like I will, I will return your message at some point. Um, cool. And yeah, what is your, what's your handle? Best way. It's a uh, first name dot last name. So cool. you put that in the note. Yeah. Ramon Dacus house. 
I cool. was going to ask how to pronounce your last name, so I'm glad you said yeah, it. Yeah, I'm glad you said it too. Ramon yeah, we'll make sure to drop it in the notes. Um, and we're excited to meet you, man. This was a great episode. I love the way it shifted and where it went. I think uh, this is a topic that was super relevant and just like clearing the noise, avoiding distractions, and just you know bringing awareness to what we're, we're all kind of going through as entrepreneurs and then yeah. I think just as, as members of society. So appreciate you, man. Thanks for your time. And uh, this was a pleasure. Awesome, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in this week to the Weekly Juice Podcast. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, and share with friends. The more ratings we get, the more ears we'll get on our show. And in turn, we'll be able to provide you with more high-quality guests. You can also find us on Instagram at Weekly Juice Pod, where we post daily tips and tricks and document our own journey towards financial freedom. Make sure to tune in every Wednesday to get your weekly juice.